So we are on to a great event this evening. We'll check in with the businesses we wouldn't typically visit because they don't have a brick and mortar presence or it is an office location. We are lucky to get a behind the scenes look at these businesses and to network with other amazing businesses in our community. Our networking event, including tonight's events, are proudly sponsored by Herod Financial Services. Thank you, Kevin, Roberta, and team for your continued support of the Chamber and greater business community. It is truly appreciated. It makes things like this possible. So we truly thank you for that. Without further ado, we welcome to our guest speakers, Alicia, Andrew, Kellen, Nicole, and Tanya. We can't wait to hear from you all. We'll begin our hop with Alicia Doris of Living Local. Living Local proudly shares the very best of Pebro and the Corthus through custom gift boxes and seasonal subscription boxes. At a time when Living Local has never been more important, they're connecting community members with new ways to love local, shop local, and support small business. One of a kind and ever evolving selections of artwork, bath and body, food and drink, and lifestyle products showcase and support individuals and families living and working in the region. Welcome to our first speaker. Alicia Doris. Hi there. Thank you, Jillian, for the introduction and to the core of the Chamber staff for having me and for hosting this event. I'd like to jump in with a question for all of you, if I may. I'm a former journalist, so I, I'm most comfortable asking questions. Um, here we go. I think you can probably see it up on your screen. Have you become more cognizant of supporting local in the last year? Let us know what you think. Yes, no, or maybe. Oh my goodness, you're above average, which we already knew, I think. <laughs> So there have been many, many studies done, but between 40 and 80% of us plan to purchase more locally post pandemic. So it looks like we're at about 88% among this group here this evening. So that's very good news for, for many of us. And uh, for my new business, um, perhaps we can, uh, turn it over to the video and I would welcome you for a behind the scenes visit to the build a box shop. Hi there, I'm Alicia Doris and I'm thrilled to be here today to tell you a little bit about my business living local. Thanks for having me coworth the chamber. So Living Local started about a year ago, right after the pandemic was declared. Unfortunately, I was laid off from my role as Director of Communications at the Canadian Canoe Museum, but I wanted to do something to support artisans and small businesses that were immediately impacted by the economic downturn. And I saw subscription boxes like this one popping up in communities across Canada and into the United States. And I knew that Peterborough and the Coorthas would be receptive to such an idea. So I launched with the first spring box last year, and that's a surprise selection of bath and body products, food and drink, artisan goods, and lifestyle goods. And the response was so very positive. I proceeded to send out a summer box, a fall box, a winter box, and um, have just finished sending out this year's spring box. But in the interim, I had uh, many requests for custom gift boxes, and it wasn't really something I was equipped to do. I didn't have inventory on hand. So in November, just in time for Christmas, I launched um, what I affectionately call the Build-A-Box Shop. And uh, with a couple of dozen products on hand gave um, shoppers the opportunity to create their own custom gift boxes um, featuring local products from Peterborough and the Corthas. So fast forward to today, I've shared over a thousand boxes in the last year and I have close to 200 products that are either made right here in the Kawarthas 
or designed here and manufactured elsewhere. So in every box, there's a card that explains that the products are from right here at home. And I'll handwrite a note card if you like. One of my favorite parts about living local is learning about new products and of course the makers behind them. We have so much to offer right here at home and uh, it's kind of like a treasure hunt every day. Um, I'm always learning about new people and new products. And as a former journalist, that's really what propels me forward, learning about the stories of the people who are our family members and our friends and our colleagues and our neighbors. People ask me if I'm ever worried about running out of new products to offer and, and my answer is not at all because the makers are always making new things and I'm meeting new people in the Corthas every day. The demand for shipping has been something that has really surprised me over the course of this past year. So at Christmas time, when I was sending out about 100 boxes a week, about a third of those were being shipped across Canada. And so it's pretty exciting to think about uh, a little piece of home, things that were created right here um, that are being enjoyed from coast to coast to coast. Thanks for listening. I'm at livinglocalbox.com. Oh, wow, that's amazing, Alicia. So it's such a great, great product and idea. We're so lucky. Thank you. Well, I feel incredibly fortunate for, um, for the support that this initiative has received over the last year. As I say, it really, it began as a passion project and has really turned into a viable uh, business venture and my career 2.0, as I call it. Um, and it's, it's really nice to be able to show you the products all at once. Um, otherwise, people just see them online. Um, this is an e-commerce business. Um, and as we know, e-commerce has had exponential growth over the last year. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to know whether your online shopping habits will continue the way that they've developed over the last year. So this is my second poll question for you for this evening. Do you think that online shopping habits developed over the last year will stay with us moving forward? Okay, so it looks like about 58% say yes, and 42% say maybe. So again, lots of studies out there, but it's anticipated that about 50% of us will continue to shop online more than we did post pandemic. So, so this is good news for all of the businesses that have either been built on an e-commerce platform or those that have pivoted pivoted to include an e-commerce platform. Um, and, and at this point, I would love to open it up to any questions that you may have for me. That's fantastic. Thank you, Alicia. So Thank I'm just you. going to kind of monitor the chat here. Sure. Um, there's some questions that people are going to ask and some in the chat. So I'm going to flip back and forth to give everyone kind of that opportunity. So the first question that came in is from Shannon. And she asked, do your makers find you or are you out on the hunt to look for new products to add? So a little bit of both. Increasingly, I'm being approached by artisans and makers and small businesses um, about having their products included. Um, at the beginning, I spent a lot of time on Instagram and quite honestly, I still do trying to find new products and um, and makers to work with. Um, but the Build-A-Box shop has given me a really nice opportunity to work with artisans who don't produce 
a lot of goods. So I can have a very small supply of something, a half dozen, for example, um, and post it on the Build-A-Box shop because the, um, the volumes for the seasonal subscription boxes have really grown and it's, it's not always feasible for a maker to do dozens and dozens of something. So That's amazing. Um, and Cindy, I saw your hand up. Did you have? I, I did, but I, yeah, I'm, I might get answered, but I, I wanted to say I love the Build-A-Box. I think that is brilliant because my kids were too old to get into the Build-A-Bear craze, but I knew people were crazy for it, but I could totally go nuts in your Build-A-Box. That, that thing that you showed us was amazing. Um, my question is, do you do stuff for um, like kids? Because I know you said like everybody's asking and so you've, you've had to do more custom stuff. So what would you say would be your age, your youngest age group? So I have a baby collection and that's an area that there's been a significant demand for. So, you know, baby showers are turning virtual and, and people are turning online to buy gifts as well. So that's an area that's growing absolutely. I think at Christmas time, I would really love to do a children's box. There are certainly uh, makers locally that, uh, that would have the products for it. Awesome. That's amazing. Thanks, Alicia. I know we have a few more questions here yep. in the chat, but I also know we're kind of tight for time. So we're going to make sure that these questions get to you and um, our staff will send them your way and you can answer. I know one is just quickly, Jack received a living local box from her daughter in Ohio this year for Mother's Day. She's wearing the necklace. Who made it? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Thanks for saying so. That warms my heart. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the, I don't know if you can see Jackie on the video or not, but it's a beautiful green, it's a penny. It's oh, it's a penny. It's the penny. Canadian the penny, penny so pendant. Okay. Yeah, I'll make it, Alicia, because the box was plain. The little box that it came in was very plain. Ah, a woman named Jessica Dunlop from Peterborough. But you know what? That's a really great point. I do like to include information about the artisan, so I will get on that. Thank you. It's beautiful. I loved it. It was great. Amazing. Thank you. That's fantastic. Well, it's nice to see that there's even people on here who have had to, that been able to experience what you have to offer. So, you know, you're touching people so close to home, they're on this call. Awesome. <laughs> so thank you, Alicia. You want to and I said, any unanswered questions or inquiries, we'll, we'll email to you. And if anyone comes up with, it, with anything else, you can email Alicia or you can email the chamber and make sure to get those to you. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to now move to our next presenter, who is Kellen Stewart of RPM3 Solutions Canada. RPM3 Solutions is a boutique enterprise risk management, ERM, software and solutions firm. RPM3's, and I apologize, Apertisoft. You can, you can correct me for 100%, Kellen. Um, software products provide tailored ERM process automation to reduce the cost of data collection, save time with powerful dashboards, analytics, and reporting, and deliver the real risk quantification and measurement needed to improve right. performance. Helen helps businesses reduce risk, reduce costs, and improve performance by using ERM. Welcome, Helen. Thank you very much, Jillian. Um, and it's called a parody soft. That's the name of our software. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize. No, that's okay. It's a, it's a hard word to say. It's, ac it's actually Latin. Um, so I work with an organization. We're actually distributed. We, we have been doing this for the last five years. I'm here in Canada. I have uh, four other members on our executive team. Our CEO is down in Maryland. Our Chief Technology Officer is in South Carolina, and our Chief Pro Programmer is in Florida. Uh, and over the past few years, we've expanded out into the world, and we're now doing business in Canada, the U.S., Mexico, Brazil, uh, the U.K., and Australia. Uh, so part of my business is asking lots of questions. So if we can have the first poll question, please.
Here we go. Do you have a strategic plan for your business? We find that risk management comes down to planning. And if you're planning with a strategic plan, then risk management helps a lot. Great. Nice little bit of planning and they're moving ahead on that. So to explain a little bit about risk management, uh, we've got a short little video to watch. And this talks about a risk profile. That's what we, that's what our software develops. Hi, I'm Kellen Sewell from RPM3 Solutions. And today I'd like to talk to you about a question I get asked. How do you develop a risk profile? At RPM3 Solutions, a risk profile to us is unique like a fingerprint. It has to have your unique goals, your unique sources of risk, your unique categories of risk. What we do then is we look at what are the sources of risk, what are the categories of risk, and how does that create different profiles or different priorities, we could say. Um, if you look at, say you had four sources of risk, one, two, three, four, but when you look at the actual riskiness of them, which has the highest risk, they might be in a different order. They might be four, one, three, two, and that's how you should be addressing them. And then for your categories as well, same thing, four different categories, it could be in a different order as to the priority. And that's what we talk about when we say, what is your risk profile? What are the areas then that are causing you pain, which is causing you a lot of risk to your business and your organization? So we think of it as individual. Individual as to what risk events you're facing, what goals you're facing, and that's one of our basic philosophies at RPM3 Solution is that everybody has a unique risk profile. If you're wondering what to do now that you've completed your risk assessment, please check out our three-part series on risk profiles. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you very much for that. Um, and in keeping with shopping local, um, that was produced by a local media company here in Peterborough. So nice to uh, showcase the work around the world. Um, okay, and we have a couple of more poll questions that I'd like to ask. Uh, if we can bring up the second one, let's, let's talk about COVID. How did it affect your business? One of the nice things about what I do is I get to speak to people around the world almost on a daily basis and I get to hear the different reactions and, and how COVID is affecting them. Has everybody got the results in? That'd be nice. There we go. Wow, 55% saw an increase. That is great. Uh, I think that speaks very well for small business here in, in, uh, in the Kawartha region. And the last question before we open up for Q&A. How did you respond to COVID? It's nice to see... Uh, if we can match up, how did this big increase that people saw, how did they, how did they achieve it? We'll get all the ones in. There we go. Those are interesting results. I, I like, uh, I like the answer about increasing customer engagement. I, I thought really that was nice and key for a lot of businesses that I talked to. It's like, who are we looking for? And yeah, looking for new revenue opportunities. I think that is one of the strengths of small businesses for this region. So those are, those are great answers to see on that. 
So our, our risk management software, we create profiles and we look at what those profiles tell us and where, what areas of the business you need to be focusing your attention on. Where is, it, where is pain being caused in your business? And from that, uh, like a strategic plan, it's only good if you put some action to it. And that's more of what we focus on is the mitigation of the risk events that get at a dentist surprise when they get when the results come in from a risk assessment and looking at that list of what is the top 10. There's usually one or two surprises on there that you didn't expect to see. So besides doing this, I also have a little side project that I'm working on. Uh, I do a, a bi-weekly podcast called Millennial versus Baby Boomer, and I co-host that with uh, Mercedes Nocaro from 705 Creative, and we've got a, a few episodes out if anybody uh, has any questions about how to start a podcast, what to think about for a podcast. Um, so please, are there any questions in the, in the chat? It looks like Cindy has a question here for you, Callum. Okay. So I just want to say, with all the other stuff, for those of you that don't know Cal, he does all that stuff. He also sits on a bunch of different committees that I know of. And so I'm not sure where he gets the time to be here with us, but he's always shows up when he's supposed to. So I, I really appreciate that. So from a risk perspective, what, do you have like, is there a general risk assessment you do for everyone and then would customize it, say, based on your business. So, for example, we're a plumbing business. So, like in the construction sector versus maybe someone like what Tanya at Structure Herrick does? No, every, every risk assessment is different. Uh, we do it unique, ground up with everyone that we work with. Um, one of the current projects that I'm working on is actually a metal, medical supply company in Australia. And they are, they are doing everything from controlling the manufacturing all the way through to the distribution and the, and the teaching uh, for the medical staff and the frontline workers who use their product. Wow. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very unique. And, and that is our basic philosophy is that every business is unique. So you face unique risks that are only known to you. Gotcha. Thank you. Kelly, do you find that any businesses are just overwhelmed by the idea and therefore avoid doing a risk assessment? Um, well, the, the, the majority of the people that we work with are already doing a risk assessment, usually on Excel spreadsheets. So they're somewhat familiar with the process. Uh, they're usually larger businesses. Uh, I would say that for smaller businesses, yeah, there is some intrepidation on, you know, what do we do? How do we go through it? And that's one of the services that we help with. Um, and it's, it's not as painful as you actually think. And we have worked with a couple of local businesses around here. We've local, worked uh, in the past with uh, Logan Tree Experts. Um, we helped them out. And Tracy helped me out at the very beginning when I got into this. That's amazing. We'll take one more question here from Andrew. Hi, uh, this might be way too complicated, but I'm just wondering if the fundamental approach for a nonprofit and a profit, whether there's sort of, there's some fundament, fundamental things that are the same, or do you approach it in a different way? No, we, we use the same process. That's, that's what it's all about with our software is, is we take you through the same process every time. So whether you're for profit or nonprofit, it, you're still going to go through that. What is the identification? How do we analyze this? Well, how do we score it? There's all these questions that will make it unique to your business. And really, it's, it's just a matter of what are the goals that the organization is looking for. And I find that, you know, with the nonprofit organizations, a lot of their times, their goals are, how, do, how many lives did we change today? Which I think is really inspiring for a nonprofit. And, and it's always exciting to work with them to, to do a risk assessment about what they are facing and how they can get better. That's amazing, Helen. Thank you. I know there's more questions, so we'll get you, as before, we'll get you to answer those either via email or they'll be sent to the chamber and, re 
can send to you so that you can answer those. Some great information. There's so many different things available in our area that will really help local businesses and our local communities. So we thank you so much for um, your time today and sharing that information with us and uh, wish you increased business during the pandemic as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Jillian. Our next presenter is Tanya Cran of Structure Hera. The Strexler Hera team specializes in small urban and rural strategic planning and economic development. They work throughout Ontario, providing economic and business development strategies, market research, business planning, database development, marketing strategies, branding and graphic design services. Strexler Hera was established in 2017 and throughout that time they have partnered with governments, manufacturers, retailers and nonprofit organizations to grow their professional brands and strategize their next moves. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so um, we do have an office and we are in Bridge North and uh, here with me is Rachel and Jackie and those are two new hires during COVID. We've actually um, seen a significant increase in our business and we've hired um, two team members and we've added a number of consultants on our team. So I believe we've got Linda and Adrian on the call tonight. Um, we do a lot of broadband uh, consulting. So we have clients all across the province uh, working on uh, broadband funding. We do grant applications. One of our clients last week on Friday was very successful. They got funding from the federal government over $800,000 to bring fiber to the home in a couple little hamlets um, in the township of Clarington. Um, so yeah, so thank you to Adrian. We've done a lot of work locally. We did a um, project with North Cortha Township, a service delivery review, making their services more efficient and uh, delivering services. And we did that with uh, Linda, who's on the call. We did a project with Aspital Norwood. Uh, we're currently engaged with Trent Lakes right now, doing some work, um, work planning. Uh, we do business retention and expansion projects across the province, and those are talking directly to business owners about their challenges. Uh, we finished up one in uh, Quinty West, and we found that the results, a lot of them were expanding during COVID, that they pivoted their business and were doing really well, and we're just wrapping up one now in uh, Penetanguishing. So, um, yes, obviously there's... Lots of hurt out there, but like the poll showed in the last uh, session, uh, people are, they were able to pivot and now are, are coming out um, better than, than, than before. So um, it's really encouraging to see uh, as a consultant um, to, to see those types of results across the province. So we mostly work in cottage country. We don't do anything in the GTA, just small uh, rural and urban uh, centers. And we haven't seen this video, so this is new to us. <laughs>
um, I haven't seen that. I don't know if Adrian's on the call or not. I think I think she had another engagement tonight. So Adrian's is um, our company is uh, two partners. So Adrian uh, Harrop and myself, we came together in 2017 to merge our companies. So um, I was Strexer, and people always ask what Strexer means, and it means strategy plus execution equals results. So we took the first few letters of those words, and then Adrian's company was the Harrop Group. So when we merged our companies, we went to Strexer Harrop. We figured law firms do it, accounting firms do it all the time. So why not? <laughs> why not economic development and marketing consultants? So uh, we've done a couple really great projects, and I believe there's a poll coming up. I'm not sure. Uh, here we go. So one of our first projects was um, uh, a really successful project, and we actually won, a, won an award for it. So does anybody know what region we won a partnership and collaboration award of excellence for with the Economic Development Council of Ontario? Was it Peterborough, Quartha Lakes, Northumberland, and Halliburton? Was it Pembroke and Laurentian Valley? Was it Quinty West? Was it Agila, Tassaronitio, Romera, and Penetang? Make your best guess. Yeah, we have to vote. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So it was a it was a project that we did with the Workforce Development Board. Um, it was one of our very first projects, and we were so proud of it. Um, as you know, lots of organizations always working really hard to do things. Um, but this project that we did with the Workforce Development Board was specifically, it was a knowledge management system. And the idea was trying to prevent people from reinventing the wheel every time. So if you were doing an economic development strategy in Kawartha Lakes, maybe you could add on to it and add Peterborough or Northumberland. So you could take the information that was in the knowledge management system and say, hey, that applies to our, our project as well. Um, like business directories, uh, business counts, economic development statistics, you know, how many businesses are in Selwyn Township versus, um, you know, Quartha Lake, that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, no, it was really nice to be recognized by the province. It was one of their biggest awards of the, of the year. So it was really fantastic to showcase the work that the Workforce Development Board does. That's amazing. Thank you, Tanya. I think it is so important the not reinventing the wheel, especially for small business to be able to use things that are already developed and just kind of adjust them. It makes a huge difference on time saving and energy. So we're going to have some questions open the floor to questions here for Tanya. Looks like Cindy has a question. Go ahead, Cindy. Thank you. I want to say too, um, on one of the other boards that I'm on, uh, we have been so privileged to work with Tanya and her team. And I think one of the great things with Tanya is that um, she builds relationships with her clients. And I think that's one of the reasons she's so successful because um, she really does bring that personal touch. So that's my that's my plug for Tanya's business, but that's not my question. My question is- Thank you, Cindy. Uh, you are welcome. Um, so analytics, so especially in this time of like COVID and people having to pivot to online, how, why is it so important to, to, to track analytics? Um, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, we see that a lot. Um, one, of, one of the biggest frustrations we have is that a lot of our clients, when they come to us, they're using a whole bunch of different systems. So, you know, they've got a, a free um, account with MailChimp, and then they also have a CRM, and they also have an Excel spreadsheet, and they, like, they have a multiple things. And sometimes they're doing that because, you know, to have a, a big CRM or another tool like an ERP system, which is enterprise resource management planning, that may be too big for your business, but having everything in a central location makes your analytics so much easier. You're able to keep the pulse on everything of what's going uh, well and what's not working well. When you have all these um, separate systems, they say they will talk to each other, but they don't. They really don't. There's a lot of, you know, back and forth and you spend a lot of time doing your analytics, but it's really, really key to do that. And we have a client that we just uh, are finishing up working with uh, they came to us, um, and actually I think Gail's on this call, so plug to Gail at uh, Community Futures for their ASAP program. 
we had a, a number of companies that we worked with, but one um, in particular, they were on the verge of closing their doors. They provided counseling services and because of COVID, they couldn't have um, people coming to in person. And well, the first thing we did with them, they wanted to spend more money on advertising. They just wanted to throw more money and we said, no, stop. We need to figure out what's going on. We need some data. And we found they were like other clients where they had, you know, their website is on Squarespace. So they had data there. They had Google search ad or Google ads. So then they had data over there. They had their social media and their Facebook ad. And so we took all of that data and we just said, look, this is what you need to be doing. And we decreased their ads and they were spending a lot of money on advertising. We slashed it at least in half. And we got an email this morning saying this is their best week ever since COVID. And it's because of the data. So it, it, it's painful, the data piece, but it's really, really important. You cannot improve what you can't measure. When we do these service delivery reviews with townships, it's all about collecting the data. What do people care about? Um, and finding ways to be more efficient so that, you know, you're not doing this report that nobody cares about because we all hate doing reports and paperwork. But if nobody cares about that report, why are you doing it? Or maybe somebody else is doing that report and they could just add a couple more pieces of data. So analytics is really, really important. And I could speak for hours on data. I love it. So <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Cindy. Awesome. Thank you, Tanya. We have kind of like a two-parter here between Kevin and Alicia. So what is the greatest challenge your business faces and the most significant challenge for your client that your clients are facing right now? So it's a little bit of a back and forth there. Okay. So with regards to our business, we struggle with it on a constant basis. Um, our business, um, we have two streams of revenue. One is word of mouth and can you quote us on this project and, and we get the work. Um, but then there's a lot of time and energy that's spent on preparing proposals, especially for municipal governments, um, because it's taxpayers dollars. So that process is to be very fair and transparent. So we will spend a lot of time and energy writing proposals. And on a daily basis, we are constantly evaluating, do we bid on this? Or do we take care of our current clients? And we have to keep a balance because you know, we, we know we have to be working on proposals to keep the, the revenue flowing, um, but it's also a lot of time and energy to take our staff away from clients to serve their, their needs to be able to bid on the staff. So that's probably the biggest challenge, but Jackie has been amazing for us. She's developed a tool, like a, no, a bid or no bid uh, spreadsheet that helps us go in and say, okay, you know, here's all the metrics, you know, do we have a, you know, do we have a, an, an edge in this opportunity, those types of things. So um, she's been really instrumental in helping us uh, do that. Um, and then it's finding the consultants that can help us on those stretch projects. Everything we do is usually unique and distinctive. It's not the same thing over and over again. So we have to go out and find consultants. Um, and then I guess for our clients, I think the hardest thing that our clients face, just because we have so like diverse, but we just find that um, it's the people. It has to do with just the employees, having the right people in the right seat, like, you know, what, what they need to do, but they often don't know what it is that they need um, and what's missing in their company. Um, but that's the biggest challenge is finding the right people. And we, you know, we had challenge with that as well, trying to find the right person because it's not, um, yeah, it, it's, it's not like, work 50 years ago where you had this job and this is what you did all day. It's like we all are wearing so many hats. Uh, so all of our clients face that challenge of finding someone that has all of the um, skills they need to be able to do their job and to also stay on top of constant changing technologies and needs from consumers. Some great advice, Tanya. And I know that's something that we all look at your, um, uh face-to-face -face communication and who's doing what roles is always something a challenge to find perfectly fit for every business. And I think everyone works really hard to make sure that happens. Some great advice. We thank you for all of your information today. And as I said, the extra questions we have will be sent to you or you can email Tanya directly. Her email's up right there on the screen for you. So thank you, we appreciate it. And thank you for all of your service with the Chamber over the years as well, because that's, I know, been a big part of your life and your business. So we thank you for that. Thank you. Our next presenter is Andrew Wolf from Lakefield Music. Hi, everyone. 
Hi, Amber. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to introduce you here if that's okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Lakefield Music was established in 1977 to support a network of amateur and professional musicians. The annual summer music camp for adults has been operating at Lakefield College School since 2004, and online workshops created last summer will become a regular winter offering. Singers and instrumentalists can participate in ensembles and workshops for classical, jazz, world, and pop music. Welcome, Andrew. I'll turn it over to you now, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so... Um, we are I guess, uh, vacationers in, uh, in Lakefield for uh, a bit more than a week. Although over the years, I'm, I'm accumulating sort of residency time from my, my week and a half every year. I've been there for uh, coming for a number of years. I won't say how, how long because I think that's part of a poll question for later on. So I won't give the answer away. Uh, just a little bit about the camp. Um, it's it's not always been just for adults, um, but over the last number of years, it has sort of morphed that way for various reasons. Um, but it does, there are, there are a lot of camps, for, uh, music camps for kids. And so uh, it's become a bit of a niche to uh, be a music camp for adults. Um, and uh, although we do get teens as well, um, that typically more uh, from the local area. Um, and, um, I mean, people might be intimidated about it, but we get people from a really wide range of abilities, um, and, and instruments and, um, a lot of people that had played a lot when they were younger and learned and then are getting back into music, um, at a later stage of life after the kids have, you know, uh, left, left home and they have time on their hands and or retired, um, uh, and are just sort of getting back into it. So we have a, a range of, of things for uh, people learning skills as well as advanced um, uh, abilities uh, to get you know into more. So it's quite kind of a, a, a neat mix. Um, it's a pretty. It's grown to a pretty large program. We have during that one week about sixty um, different workshops and ensembles that are going on uh, throughout the day. Uh, you sort of build your program like at school, where there's six periods in the day and um, from various different types of workshops and ensembles um, that you, you're able to do or are interested in doing. Um, and we have a pretty loyal following over the years. About two-thirds of the people are uh, from our uh, group that we would get each year, which has lately been running between 120 and 140 participants. About two thirds have been before. Uh, so it's a nice mix of new people and enough people that have been before that kind of know what's going on and um, uh, you know, kind of make things go smoother and, and can kind of um, uh, help help newbies along and things like that. Um, and let me see what else. Uh, I don't know why, but we tend to be in a bit of an older crowd. <laughs> um, uh, maybe it's, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just when people start getting having the time or whatever to do to do it. Um, but um, I, people, when people call and ask, you know, is, is it all a bunch of youngsters and am I too old? I said, no, you can't be too old. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's all about music. So the age really doesn't matter. Um, and in case you're thinking it's just all a bunch of people from Toronto, it's it's not. Um, typically, we have about roughly by only forty percent of the people attending are are from uh, the GTA, um, and the rest are spread um, mostly across Ontario, you know, from Ottawa um, to Windsor. Um, typically, maybe forty different communities or cities. Um, if I look through the through the results. And we also do get a um, uh, uh, sprinkling of people from across Canada as well. Um, the only two provinces in recent memory we're missing is Saskatchewan and Newfoundland. So we need to we need to reach out to those. But we we've, we've had uh, participants from all the other provinces, um, and uh, we do get uh, we do have some regulars uh, that come from the United States. Uh, great bargain for them to come up here. Uh, for price wise, and we've had people come from Europe and uh, Jamaica a few years ago. Um, often they're coming to visit 
family and or or people they know or used to be here and are working away and they're coming back and including the week at camp as part of their vacation um, here. Um, so lots going on. Um, and uh, so uh, Cassie with this video kind of, uh, it's a project that I've been interested in doing for a long time. So um, her prompt to do this video, it, um, it was, uh, had to be done quickly and, and I hope you still have some fingernails left because I just sent it to her <laughs> not that long ago. Um, but uh, this is sort of um, a, a, a bit of a story of a week at, a week at camp. Um, so I'll let you roll that. Andrew, that's amazing. I think that video gave us a great appreciation of kind of this overall feeling of the camp. And I think many of us just emotional connection when music is being played and seeing everyone trying something new and working together is just incredible, especially during these times. I think right now it is question period. We're getting short on time. So there's a lot of great questions and comments in the 
which um, the, the one thing that I, I'm just going to choose one here. Uh, aside from, there, they look like there's a dance studio. So this is from Sherry. Aside from music, what other activities does the camp offer? <laughs> um, it's really funny. You always say, you know, we go to this beautiful place on the lake and we spend the entire week in the basement playing music. Um, so we do have a morning stretch and we do have a, a, an, um, during the midday break, a sort of a little a dance kind of thing. Um, and a couple of the classes, we tried to incorporate some dance in it. So the one picture you saw was um, called Battle Folk, um, and which is um, sort of European dance music. So um, sort of older European dance music. So people come play with their instruments, but they also learn the dances that are associated with the folk dances that are associated with it. So some people like to just come and just do be part of the dance and not do the instrument part. Um, and then sort of the African drumming usually has some movement. So it is heavily focused on, on music. Um, and, um, yeah, it'd be nice to try to incorporate more, but it's already kind of so a bit <laughs> overwhelming with all of that there. Um, but it, it, you know, in a way, it's a, a bit like a kids' camp, and, and like there's these really great bonds that are made because it, it's it's an intense week, um, and can be emotional, you know, just because it's music. Uh, but great, um, you know, great bonds are formed there uh, between the teachers and participants, and between participants. And I forgot about the poll. <laughs> That's okay. We'll just put those poll questions up now. So it's never too late to uh, to learn. Um, well, there are some potential summer camp people in there in in the group. So, um, yeah, great. Uh, and I guess I, I I forgot to mention, but maybe there. Um, also, the the star is uh, Lakefield College School. Um, we we're, uh, we we take up uh, residence there. John Boyko is the director of summer programs, and I've been working with him uh, for for many years. Sort of starting in in the winter time, starting to get planning together and um, for the summer. And the cycle it's it's one week, but the cycle runs kind of all all year round. It's like planning a wedding every year or something like that. You know, you sort of have every month has a, has a little job that needs to get done in, in the preparation. Um, we have about two dozen teachers um, so to, to look after because with all those different instruments and ensembles, it just requires a lot of specialists. Um, uh, they're great. Most of them really love just coming back year after year. So there's a great bond between the teachers and the participants that come back. And many of them end up taking private lessons with them um, and things like that. So um, it's really great. It's, it's totally non-competitive people, you know, or it's just really about the joy of music. So it's, it is quite a, a little, little bubble for a week. Um, sort of forget about the rest of the world. It was great before Lakefield brought in Wi-Fi because you were just kind of cut off from the world. Now they have Wi-Fi. Everybody's on their phones all the time. So <laughs> you really could just like forget about the world for a week. Um, Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. That's, it's fantastic. If you ever decide to do a winter one, I'm totally in. Summer's a little bit too busy time for me running a cottage resort, but I would love to go anytime there's one in a, a winter session. Sign me up. We appreciate well, it. I, and thank you for um, highlighting Lakeville College School as well. I just mentioned quickly, like, funny you mentioned that because as uh, part of COVID, we started the, to bring it to online. And so we are going to be running an online, different, but an online version in the winter. Each oh, time. awesome. Uh, so different kinds of things, but. Maybe you um, could share yeah. that information with the chamber and we'll share it with our members as well. Thank you. Thanks again. And our next presenter is organized by design, Nicole Cook. Organized by design offers professional organizing to the residential and commercial clients. Services include purging and decluttering, space planning, storage solutions, packing and move management, filing systems, as well as process streamlining and redesign for commercial clients. Organized by design services that Kortha region on site, 
but also offers virtual services to clients outside of home. And I think at this time of year, and with so many people working from home, this is a much needed anti-stress, excellent option available. <laughs> so please share with us. You there, Nicole? Uh, I have. Oh, to, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Okay, my internet halfway through um, the last video uh, went down in the whole subdivision, <laughs> so I had to grab my phone. So I'm just trying to get set up on my phone. So my apologies if I'm not in focus because I actually can't see myself in my phone right now. Um, so thank you to the chamber for allowing me to come on tonight to chat a little bit about my business. And uh, it's funny because when we were first starting the meeting tonight, a few of us had come online and we were sort of joking about working in our homes and the clutter and, you know, just trying to make office space. So um, our first poll question actually touches on that. So here it is. Ah, yes, absolutely. Um, so it's actually scientifically proven that if you have clutter on your desk or in your house, it does make it difficult for you to be productive. You do lose focus. And uh, Harvard University actually has done lots of studies on this. Um, so having a clear office space actually does increase your productivity. Uh, so we were talking about um, video and uh, sort of behind the scenes look at what we do in our office and uh, I don't actually work out of an office. So here is my video about where I work from. Hi, I'm Nicole Cook and my business is called Organized by Design. Organized by Design is a professional organizing service and we work with both residential and commercial clients. So for our residential clients, we can help with things like organizing kitchen cupboards, uh, garages, downsizing, and we also do packing and moving services as well. For our commercial clients, we can help businesses with space planning, we can help with um, inventory management. We can also look at your systems and make sure that the processes that you're using are efficient and the most streamlined that they can be. So we sort of do whatever clients need um, for us to do to help make them more organized and more efficient. So I thought today I would actually, because I don't have a storefront, show you my office. So. Here is my office. So in the back of my van, I keep everything that I need for my business. So I have different size bins, um, underbed storage bins, you know, small stacking bins that you can use in homes or for inventory management. I also keep cardboard boxes. I have a big roll of bubble wrap back there and a table so that when I'm working on things like uh, kitchen. I have another space to be able to take things out of cupboards and put them on to sort. I also keep a variety of small items. So these are just little organizers you could use in your drawers. These are ones that you can use in your um, in your bedroom, either in cupboards or in drawers as well. So I try to have a variety of things so that when I arrive to see a client, um, I can show them these items and we can discuss what options will work best for them in their home. And let me show you my desk. This is my desk because this goes with me everywhere I go. So. Every time I go in to see a client for the first time for a consultation, whether it's a commercial client or a residential client, I bring this bag in and I have everything here from labelers to tape measures uh, to command hooks, which are my favorite thing in the world. If you haven't learned all about command hooks, please go on YouTube and find out about them because they are absolutely fabulous. 
um, zip ties, drop cloths to cover furniture if we're doing work that, uh, you know, things might get a little too dusty. So this is sort of like one shop stop shopping for me in my little bag. So anyway, so this is what I do and this is where I do it from. So I service uh, Peterborough and the Corthas and I also do work virtually so I do have clients that live at a distance that we do work over the phone or clients that will send me pictures or videos of their space and then I can offer suggestions to them so thank you so much for watching and if you want to learn some tips and tricks about organizing please feel free to follow my Facebook and uh, Instagram pages at Organized by Design you can also reach out to me with questions um, at uh, organizedbydesign.co is my website, but I also uh, have a cell phone you can reach me on anytime, 705-313-9522. Thanks so much and have a great day. So um, the second poll question is actually to see if you were watching what I was talking about in the first, in the, uh, in the video. So here's the second one. Absolutely, 88% of you were correct. We, uh, for Organized by Design, we do all of those, um, all of those tasks. A lot of people think that uh, professional organizers um, just do kitchen cupboards and, and help you declutter, but uh, there are a few of us that do, um, do other work that is involving businesses and helping them to become more efficient um, and, and just trying to give sort of that broader uh, perspective to organization that it's not just about clearing clutter in your house. And um, the other thing that I really try to focus on with my clients is the whole idea of systems. And so, I mean, we could go in and clear your clutter and make everything nice and tidy, but if we don't really identify what you do day to day in your home, for example, and what caused the clutter to start, then in a month or six months time, it's gonna probably look the same. So what we really try to focus on is how do we put new systems in place uh, for you and your family so that the clutter stays away so that you can, you know, get out of the house quickly in the morning, not be running around trying to find keys and, and that type of thing. So, um, so that actually leads into the third poll question. So is this a yes or a no? <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. And um, a lot of people don't realize that the stress that they feel can often be purely because of their environment. Um, you know, if you are constantly trying to, you know, run around the house in the morning, finding things, looking for kids' agenda books, can't find your keys, you know, it's raining out, don't know where your umbrella is, just starting your day like that can be really chaotic and really just not set you up for the rest of the day for a nice day. So um, all of the clutter and, and um, you know, mess and no systems can really over time take a toll on your mental health. And I do have clients that I work with that do struggle with mental health issues. Um, I am often referred to clients through their therapists because clutter is a big deal. And um, so, so if I can help you at all with with clutter either in your house or uh, systems in your businesses, then please feel free to reach out to me. And thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Thank you, Nicole. That's some great information. And I think something that everyone struggles with is trying to figure out the best use of space and the best decrease of stress. So we have a number of questions. We'll take a few of them now. And then the rest obviously will be emailed to you or sent to the chamber and they'll share those with you. So Kellen Sewell asked, are there any tips to organize computer files? 
Okay, so computer files, um, one of the things I noticed with a lot of uh, my clients uh, or just even homeowners that are using their home computer is just not setting up file folders in your computer like you would um, in your home if you had a filing cabinet. So using file manager, using those types of systems to actually group your files together so that it's much easier to, um, to find things is really, really key. And I do help set that up for a lot of my clients. And it does, even with my, my teenage daughters, when I taught them how to do it, it makes a huge difference um, when they're trying to find an assignment and uh, they can just kind of find it at their fingertips. So um, using file folders is the best way to do it. Awesome, thank you. Um, another one, and I think many of us feel this way, Michelle Gay asks, what advice do you have for people who just have a hard time letting go of clothing? And I know sometimes there's emotional connections to where things came from or a period of time in our life. And so any suggestions would be much better. Um, it, it's funny because I, um, I, I've recently been asked that question a few times, just people are trying to do some closet purging. And um, basically what I tell people is, you know, first of all, um, is it, is it torn? Is it, you know, covered in paint? Is, does it fit? You know, all of those things. Is there a reason why you're not wearing it? So if you're not wearing it, then it should probably go. Um, sometimes we have that sentimental attachment to an item. Um, it could be a clothing item or something else, but um, if it's a sentimental attachment, then I suggest you take a picture of it. And that way you can keep the picture and remember all the things about the shirt or the, you know, the, the dress or whatever it is without actually having to keep the item cluttering your house. And um, I find that tends to be really effective for people because if you have the item and you have a picture of the item, the same memories are going to come back to you about that item, whether it's in person or just in a picture. So it's a great way to um, eliminate things in your house that you really don't use anymore. Um, and uh, are just really taking up space. So take a picture of those favorite clothes. Thanks, Nicole. And then you can put that picture in those well-organized computer files that you already explained. Exactly. So it'll work out for everything. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Any of those other questions that people have, as I said, will be sent to you. We do appreciate it. We are getting to time here. So I'm gonna hold on to those and send them to you. And we're going to do some closing remarks. So thank you to our incredible guest speakers for joining us today and speaking to us about the amazing work they do. We are lucky to have such remarkable businesses in our community. Thanks again to our networking sponsor, Herod Financial. Your support of these events is deeply appreciated. Please take a few minutes tonight to submit one or more nominations for the Awards of Excellence. I know local businesses will truly appreciate being recognized for their hard work this year. So go to corthachamber.ca. There's a button right on the homepage that will take you to nominations. Please nominate. And um, the business does not have to be a chamber member to nominate them for these awards. So just recognize those businesses that might not even be aware of what the chamber has to offer. I think that's also important. A reminder of the lunch and learn on May 27th. Canva is an easy to use but effective graphic design platform. Our next networking event is Hop Around the Corthas. It's on June 9th, and we will be using our virtual format to travel across our entire service area in one night. Watch our newsflash and social media to sign up. So thank you everyone for attending. You're welcome to stay on and chat if you wish. Otherwise, have a fantastic evening. And again, thank you so much to our sponsors and to everyone who came out and shared such incredible information and videos with us. It's amazing what we have to offer in this area. We do appreciate it and appreciate your support of our local chamber as well.